Well, as the song goes, it says this is the most wonderful time of the year. For those of you who like to shop, this could be the most wonderful time of the year. To those who do not like to shop, this is the worst time of the year. If you're a social person and you love getting together with your family, with friends, and you like the the whole thing called party, this is like the most wonderful time of the year. Those of you who are a bit introverted and wherever people are gathering, it's tough for you even to be here on a Sunday. It's like a horrible time of the year. For those of you who like to decorate and get up on ladders, this is a terrible, a wonderful time of the year. Those that don't like that, you know, we decorate on the inside, and even that is, is quite minimal. So for some, yeah, it's, it's the most wonderful, oh, all this great stuff going on. Others, it's sort of, oh my, I'll just get through it. God get us to December 26th. God get us to January 2nd. Just get this nonsense over. Get life back to normal. I do better in normal than in special. That's where some folks are at. I get it. The one big thing is everyone is looking for a place to belong. And some people thinking, I've never belonged anywhere. I don't think I'll ever belong anywhere. I am different. I am abnormal. Or we look at people that well, they are they are weird. They are bizarre. They're like interplanetary. I mean, that's how different they are. So they've come to the conclusion that maybe, maybe I'm just not going to fit. And I, I told you two Sundays ago when it comes to misfits, and if you're looking at me, you're looking at one. Just, just am. Didn't, didn't plan for that. It's just the way things have worked out. Just know that on this earth, in a large degree, we're all, we're all misfits. Uh, I also know God does some of his very best work in misfits. So if you're one of them, because some of you go, going, that's me. God does some of his very best work in people who don't fit very well on this earth. So I go, welcome to the club. You know, welcome to the misfit club. In fact, really, uh, the church is the club of misfits. Because we don't fit in this world. We, we, we can't. And so... In the church, we, we should fit, but sometimes even in church, we don't seem to fit all that well. In, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it, it's known as the, the Faith Hall of Fame, and it talks about these Old Testament saints. don't know if you've ever been there. Maybe it's been a while. And it said that, that Abraham, you know, one of, the, one of the patriarchs, he lived as an, as an alien. An alien means you live here, but you don't belong here. That's what it means. You're here, but really, really, you belong elsewhere. You, you don't fit here. You, you exist here. Uh, it said, these saints desire a better country. And we're not talking about, let's say, France. We're not talking about Canada. We're talking to, of a heavenly country. Any country down here just isn't going to get it done. Then it speaks of these different ways that they, they were tortured and, and then murdered here. And then in verse 38... It just says this, these are men, and and it includes some women in there too, but these are men of whom the world was not worthy. You know, they they wandered. You you get that word wandered. They they, they walked around. They they sojourned. And this is where they hung out. They hung out in deserts. I just got back from a desert. It was over in Israel. I don't like deserts. You know what a desert is? It's a hot place. Dirt, sand, rocks. There aren't hardly any trees. There's very little shade, almost no water. That's desert. Desert is is where people go to die. Sometimes in Scripture, desert is where God does some of his best formational work in people. I don't like desert. I like oasis. Don't you? I would rather have a condo on the Mediterranean any day than live in the middle of a desert. But Paul did not write the New Testament on a condo in the Mediterranean. 
Because God does not do his best work when we're on vacation. Can I just put it that way? I'm not saying vacations are bad. You shouldn't go on one. But God doesn't do his best work when you're on vacation. God doesn't do his best work in the middle of a buffet. I love the work God does in buffet. But it's not his best work. If we could just have buffet in the middle of desert. Or you'd say dessert. They wandered in deserts. And mountains and caves. And holes in the ground. Who wants to, who wants to live of that kind of life? I, I don't like to wander. I like to hunker down. Especially on a day like today. Especially on a night that's coming like tonight. Cold. Cold. I don't want to be in a desert, a mountain, a cave, or a hole in the ground. I want to be near heat. And thankfully, you and I, we're, we get to be near heat. But those, that's, what, that's what these people, these, these men of faith, are the undesirable things that we, we, we detest. These, these people, they say, they did not fit in this world. They, they were misfits. It's okay. I want to talk about the ultimate misfit. The ultimate misfit when it comes to this world is Jesus Christ. It is. Uh, the Christmas issue itself made him a misfit. You know, I'm going to just read a, a bit here. Uh, now, the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, Christ, Jesus Christ was as follows. When his me- mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary. As your offer. That which has been conceived in here is of the Holy Spirit. So she did not have relations with a man. It's, it's of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 23, behold, the, this virgin, right, shall be with child. That just doesn't happen. And she's going to bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means, you know, God is with us. You know, that is the strangest birth ever. You know, conceived by way of the Holy Spirit. His mother Mary was a virgin. This union is what's called the hypostatic union. Hypostatic union means there is, there is the divine nature and the, and the human nature is now taken up residence in one being. That's never happened before. It'll never happen again. Just this one single time. Jesus is now fully 100% God, fully 100% human being. That, that's never happening again. It'll never happen again. It, it, just this one time. It goes, it's not normal. Jesus isn't normal. He's, he's unique, one of a kind. All of his life, he will stand out. He's not going to fit. He's not going to fit down here. He can't. One more thing. And it, it says, uh, 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 yeah, she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in, in cloths and laid him in a, in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We're not really sure. People are going, what this place was? Was it like a barn-like thing? Was it sort of a, a place, a, like a tool shed? Is it... Some believe now it was like the lower level room of, of a residence. That maybe they had two or three levels and they kept the animals on the first level. And so when they put Mary and Joseph in this place, it was where all the animals hung out, but it really was a part of their house. But Jesus was born amongst animals. It's, he's placed in a, in a manger, which is an, an animal food trough. It's, Sort of as a cradle. That's where they put him. Years ago, when, when people, when um, parents had babies, they would put him in, in a, uh, a clothes basket. Huh? Yeah, we didn't have fancy, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they'd put him in these clothes baskets. And they'd put a towel or a blanket in there. And that's all you had. And that was great. And then they came out with them. I guess fancier things for, for babies, but then they didn't even have a clothes basket. They put him in this manger. And 
That's where hay and, and, and stuff was at. And I know for some of you ladies going, you know, giving birth around a bunch of animals, that doesn't sound like what we would, it doesn't sound very hygienic. I mean, isn't there germs on animals? I go, probably. And you know how animals are? They get curious. They're probably sitting there over there looking. What's going on over there? Eh? Having a baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a dog and a cat. They're always kind of looking around, see what's going on. I don't think they can figure it out, but to tell them it's like entertainment. So they're watching, we're watching this birth take place. What we do know, what we do know, whether it was outside or inside, is, is that it smelled like a barn. Have you been in a barn lately? You know what barn smells like? It smells like nothing else anywhere else. It's it's it has distinct odors. It's a barn. When's the last time you saw a cow or a horse or a sheep or a pig who were potty trained? They still don't probably sit there and want to go out. They they do their business where they're at and they don't care. And so where where Mary is giving birth has all these animal smells and, and animal noises. You go, what kind of a place is that for the Messiah to be born? You'd think he'd have been born in, in the greatest place of all. You know, there'd been a parade. But there wasn't that. It was a sort of a normal or lower, it wasn't a a despicable place to them. But it wasn't one of prominence. But that's how the transcendent God came to us in in this lowly place. Uh, Not as pampered and privileged, but as 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 a meek person. Now, hear this, that never, never think that one, one's importance or your importance is dictated by your surroundings. Because if, if it was dictated by his surroundings, he would have been no one. They, the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover. But oftentimes we do. We want people to know that, that what you see isn't totally who I am. The most important part of me, you can't see. Maybe one day you will. But Jesus, you never would have thought. He was king of kings. Not like this. Just some some peasant child from a peasant family who's going nowhere. Probably life won't amount to much. And yet 2,000 years later, he is talked about, read about, spoken of more than anyone else that's ever been born. But he was born as someone who really didn't belong. In the life of Jesus, it says, he, he was a holy person. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. To be holy is to not be normal. To be holy, the word actually means to be set apart, to be set over here. And in this context, to be set apart for the purposes of God. And let you, let you know that we are to be holy as He is holy, meaning we too are set apart and need to be set apart for the purposes of God, meaning that we don't often fit in. Because we're set apart. That's okay. Aren't you glad Christ didn't always fit in? And you'll be a misfit in this world. You just will. You young people, try to be a holy person in high school. Just try. What's it, what's it going to take to be a holy person in high school? Or a holy person in junior high school? What's it going to take? Because some of, you, some of you have. Or some of you, when you were back there, you, you were. You know what it means to be a holy person in high school? It means you're going to be seen by others as being a weirdo. Or they think, you think, you're better than what they are. And you won't be invited. And sometimes you will be sitting by yourself. And hopefully you'll try to find other holy people to, to connect with. Not just high school, not just junior high school. You try to be a holy person in your families. 
It may be a church-going family. You try to be a whole person in a, in a lot of church-going families. And not always, but oftentimes it means that you're going to not fit in that family. Try to take a stand for God. And sometimes correct erroneous, sinful ideals. And you'd be told, don't you rock the boat here. We're just here to kind of get along. You try to be holy anywhere, and and you're not going to fit in very well. You should in a church, but sometimes even in churches, the holiest of people are not received all that well. They're seen as being bizarre, weird, from another place, don't know what's in their mind. But I'm glad to be a holy person, and you should be too. And another person in Jesus, another time in Jesus' life, this, this father comes down and he bows before Jesus and he says, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she's gonna live. Interesting. My daughter's dead, but you can resurrect her. You just come. And this is how it goes. And when Jesus came into the into the official's house and saw the little the flute players and and the crowd and and noisy disorder, he began to say, depart, for the girl is not dead, but is asleep. And you know what they did? They started laughing at him. Can can you you imagine that? Here, the, the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, the great physician, the one who knows everything and can do anything, comes in, makes this diagnosis. You think she's dead? She's not dead. She's asleep. And they know better. And they weren't stupid people. And they just start laughing. Jesus is the butt of a joke. What does he know? You know, we've seen dead people before. We've seen what happens when someone dies and she's dead. And so, so, when the crowd had been put out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Can you imagine that? Over the years, I've done a number, a number, a number of funerals. And every time... You know, there's grieving and crying. People's hearts are heavy and they don't know if they can continue on and life will never be the same again. And I always thought, you know, if I could just, if I had a magic prayer or if I had, if I had a, a, a special substance A water out of the Jordan, some people do. Or some oil from, or some dust, or say, if I, if I, if I had a, and if I could just, what do you think would happen if during a funeral, and this person's dead, And the next thing you know, they sit up, look out, wave, say, hey, kind of hungry. Let's get out of here. Let's go get something to eat. First, we would be quite surprised. But you would have thought, you would think, you would think. Um, maybe I didn't have it. You would think that uh, these people would be so happy. And the news went out into all the land. You'd think that there'd just be an eruption of joy. Another time, 
Jesus in the synagogue on the Sabbath, there was a man with a deformed right hand, and the right religious teachers were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath day was a day of, of rest, and, and work was considered, or healing was considered to be work, they couldn't do that. And then he says also, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it? He goes, I, I want to know, what do you think? And you will know if the whole place, the whole place, was silent. Well, I don't know. Can, can we do good on the Sabbath? Can we save a life? Can we heal on the Sabbath? And so, and so Christ, he says, looking around at them all, he said, stretch out your hand. And the person did. He didn't say a prayer. He didn't talk about faith. He didn't say, are you, he just said, stretch out your hand. And the person did. And the hand was completely restored. about that now you would have thought you would have thought here and the crowd erupted in spontaneous applause next verse no you say, oh, that's not right you would have thought it would have done that did you see that that's a miracle we have a we have a story we were here we're eyewitnesses that's fantastic that's not what happened Here's what really happened. But they themselves were filled with rage and discussed what they might do to Jesus. Wait a minute. He just healed somebody. Hand's not good. Hand is not good. No, no medication. No, no surgery. Doesn't need any physical therapy. The hand is perfect. And you thought they would have been in amazement. No, no. They are so angry at Jesus. How, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? How dare you do what we know is not right? How dare you? And so they went out to discuss what they're going to do to him, how they're going to hurt him. They're so mad, they're going to take him out. <laughs> what? He heals and now he's hated? That's right. See, this, this Jesus just never, ever, he never, ever fit into this world. Can I tell you, holy people and, and set apart and miss, they, they just don't. I go, they're a, they're a lone voice crying out. Oftentimes, you stand alone because no one will stand with you. And that's not easy to do. It takes a lot of courage at every age to stand up and stand for what you believe in. Not many will do it. Many will cave in. Often, these folks are misunderstood and they are gossiped about. They are envied sometimes, often alone, often hurting, almost never fitting in, not anywhere. Born to be different and born to make a difference. I believe that everyone here wants to make a difference. But to make a difference, you have to be different. You can't be just like everyone else and make a difference. It's impossible. But when you try to make a difference, when you're about change, people will sometimes just want to cut you down. Can't you take it easy? Don't don't rock the ship. Come on. Life's hard enough. We've been through enough. Take it easy, why don't you? Just enjoy. And that's just never what Christ did. It's not what we're called to do. Make a difference and have the courage to be different because you are. And I go, what a difference he made and aren't you glad he did? It could be that that you don't fit socially very well. I mean, I mean, sometimes it, it could be you just don't know what to say. And so social interaction, it's it's not easy. 
and you don't like casual conversation, but sometimes that's just what it requires, and uh, you're, you're always looking how to go home or a way not to even go. Can I have an out here? Maybe you come up with a game plan as when you can leave because it just doesn't work for you. Don't you wish sometimes that you could be like others and how they can just talk and people listen and, and they're included and, and maybe that's not who you are. You know what? Maybe you don't even fit in with your family. It doesn't mean you don't have a good family. You could have a great family and still not fit into your family. You don't know why? Because you're just different. Maybe they're all in Christ. I'm not saying that. But even in, in a family that, that all follows Christ, some are going to go, I, ah. you know, I, I march to the beat of a different drummer. I'm just not, I'm just not like my, my brothers and my sisters and my mom and my dad and my cousins. I'm, I'm just not like them. And, and, and I can't be. It's not easy. You think differently and you're different. Or maybe you're from a, a different ethnic background. And, and when people look at you, they, they know you're different. They know you're different. I know. I remember a number of years ago, my wife and I, we flew in from, from Scotland and, our, and we flew into Atlanta. And you have to go through customs, immigration, and these things. Here's my wife with a, a British passport. She wasn't a citizen then. There I am with the US, United States passport. The, the agent comes to me and he, he looks at me straight in the eyes and he goes, says this, Do you speak English? I can remember thinking, you keep it up and you won't. <laughs> Remember the one time I flew into Alaska? And we're getting off the plane, and the one flight attendant says, Hey, good to be home, huh? <laughs> yeah, I just made it, made it in time for the I did it, Rod. Thank you. <clears throat> Or maybe you weren't born and raised in, in this country. And, uh, and so when you think about home, you're not thinking about here. I mean, you may love the United States, but to those folks, it, it's, it's still not home. Great things that are here, but it's, it's, it isn't home. I go, all you misfits... Uh, we can all identify with Jesus. You see, at some point in his ministry, someone told Jesus that he would follow him anywhere. Wherever you go, I will follow. And, and Jesus says this. He says, well, it says the, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have, have nests. but I don't have anywhere to lay my head. What he's saying is, you think you want to follow me. And I'm sure right now you, you mean that. But do you have any idea what that means? You see, a, a fox has a home. And, and birds, they have a home. But I don't have a home. So, if you're okay in being homeless, well, then you'll, you can follow me. But if you're not okay with that, you're not going to follow me. Or maybe you will for a while. Or maybe you will, but you'll drag your feet. But you're not going to like it. You don't understand that, that where I go is not an easy path. When's the last time you've been homeless? I've always had a place to lay my head. I've always had a house. I've always, I, I always have. It doesn't mean I've always belonged, but it means, it means that at least I, I was able to sleep inside. 
I don't know. Maybe people are maybe rethinking it. Well, now you put it that way. Well, let, tell you what. Let me, let me go and bury, bury dad first and not come, all, come on along. You know, let me go and t- take care of some business and I'll, I'll be right there. Isn't that what we say sometimes? You know, just, 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 just let me get out of school. I'll get there. I'll follow you someday. Just, 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 just let me, when I get that new job, or as soon as, when I'm out on my own, and when I hit 30, 50, whatever the age is, as soon as the kids are gone, as soon as the kids are gone, I'm going to be right there. And Jesus says, look, if you don't want to follow, you're not going to follow. But it's not easy. It's not easy being a misfit. It's not easy not having a place to really call home. But if you are one, and in some ways we all are, you can identify with Jesus Christ. Because when he walked this earth, he didn't fit either. He knows what it's like to not fit. And so we can do this life with him. And, and that's exactly why he came to this earth. He came from heaven to this earth. He left home to come down here. Knowing he wasn't going to fit. But that we don't either. But he gets it. And so whenever you don't fit, you can in large ways relate to Christ because he didn't either. But misfits should always fit in the family of God. Should, but don't always. They should. Jesus' misfits can always fit with him. Always. He has been pursuing you these past 24 hours, even if you did not know it. He wants to do this thing called life with you and me. He longs, he longs to spend time and for you to give him attention. He loves that. He walked it, he knows it, he gets it. And whenever you feel out of place, which maybe is quite often, you can be in a great place with him. That's why he came. Um, don't put him off. Would you pray with me? Lord, it's it's tough to comprehend how badly you want to be in relationship with us. We, we, know, we know the Bible says that, that God loves us. And in one sense, we get it. Somewhere else, I don't really get it. Glad for it, but don't really understand it. There's a reason we feel so uncomfortable on this earth. And the reason is we just don't really fit in on this earth. And they'll be okay with that because Christ didn't either. And knowing if, that if we are Christ followers, we don't have to fit in down here. We can be aliens and sojourners. That maybe we do live in caves and holes in the ground, just bizarre things. Because one day we're going to be citizens or living in a better country, a heavenly one. So, in the meantime, may we count all things as loss in order to gain Christ. With that, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.